supporting and advocating internationally for the full engagement of women in all aspects of the computing field. ACMW's most prestigious award is the Athena Lecturer Award. This celebrates women researchers who have made fundamental contributions to computer science. Each year, ACMW honors one woman as the Athena Lecturer. This year's lecturer, recipient of the Lecturer Award, is Susan Sue Dumay. As many of you already know, in Greek mythology, Athena is the goddess of wisdom, courage, inspiration, civilization, law and justice, mathematics, strength, the arts, crafts, skill, and war strategy. Having <laughs> That's Sue's favorite, I think. Having known Sue for a very long time and having been lucky enough to have had support and advice from her in my own career, I can honestly say she has many Athena-like qualities and traits. She's the strength and craft it takes to pursue difficult problems in HCI and computer science and to communicate those, those ideas with great elegance. She was born and raised in Lewiston, Maine. She got a BA in mathematics and psychology from a liberal arts college. And then she went on to graduate with a PhD in cognitive psychology from Indiana University. She's been a really strong contributor to our CHI community for very many years. She started out her career at Bell Labs and Bell Corps. And she, in 1997, went to Microsoft Research where she has been doing stellar groundbreaking research and also acting as an adjunct professor at the University of Washington. She presented a paper at the very first ACM CHI conference in 1983. This paper was called Using Examples to Describe Categories. She also has the distinction of presenting a very memorable paper with a very hard to parse title at the CHI 1992 Gaithersburg meeting. I'm going to try and say it here. Follow me, please. Statistical semantics. How can a computer use what people name things to guess what people mean when they name things? She was clearly ahead of her times and the times. She was already struggling with the hard problems that she is now really bringing big solutions to. It's what we call personalization in search and information ret retrieval. This theme runs throughout Sue's research, and she's always been very interdisciplinary and had a user-centered perspective. She takes a very broad approach and really tries to bring users into everything she does. She's been recognized in the HCI community, the IR community, and the web sciences community for her research, and her awards are equally broad and well-deserved. She was inducted into the Chi Academy in 2005, recognized as an ACM Fellow in 2006. She received the SIG IR Gerard Salton Award for Lifetime Achievement in 2009 and was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering in 2011. She received the Tony Kent Strix Award in 2014. So I'm very happy that she is also now the Athena Lecturer. She's been a tireless contributor in terms of service for CHI as well. She's been involved in a number of program committees She's run a number of doctoral consortia, and she has mentored many people informally. She and Judy Olson were the CHI PC co-chairs in 1994. And at that time, some of you remember, submissions were on paper. Paper. Remember that? Who remembers paper? Um, I also want to note that uh, Judy Olson was recognized as an Athena lecturer in 2011. So this incredibly powerful team have continued to be influential and happily have been recognized. Sue is the first person from industry to be recognized as the Athena lecturer. And she thus illustrates it's possible to do amazing research, inspire generations of researchers, peers as well as younger researchers, and influence products that have an effect on the lives of millions. This is a really well-deserved award for Sue, and it's a great achievement for us, the HCI community. I would really like you all to congratulate and welcome Sue Dumay to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth, for the, uh, the wonderful introduction. 
I'm deeply honored by, by this award, especially since the nomination um, was by my peers, both in HCI and IR. As Elizabeth noted, I really value the importance of a broad interdisciplinary perspective in at attacking problems, and it, it's wonderful to see this um, recognized. But it, it's not just an award for me, it's really an award for everybody in this room and to the broader CHI community. As Elizabeth said, ACM awards one of these a year, and so I, I take it as a recognition by ACM of the importance of the kinds of co core pursuits that we have in the human computer interaction community more to computing as well as to more broadly in, in people's lives. And I'd like to shout out especially to Judy Olson who, again, Elizabeth mentioned, uh, received the award about four years ago and spoke at CSCW and was co-chair with me at, uh, for papers almost 20 years ago. So what I'd like to do in the talk today is talk about large-scale behavioral log data uh, and both some of the amazing opportunities as well as some of the p challenges and limitations of, of these. The rise of web services over the last decade has made it possible to gather traces of human behavior in situ as people are working in their natural environments at a scale and fidelity that is, was previously unimaginable. This has really transformed how web-based systems are designed, evaluated, and improved. So there are amazing opportunities as, as well as challenges here. Using examples from web search, I'll talk about two kinds of, of logs. I'll highlight how using observational logs can provide a rich new lens onto the diversity of the people, tasks, and interaction strategies that we see in the web. And I'll also talk about how experimental logs can transform how we design and evaluate uh, web systems. I'll also talk at the end about some of the challenges and, and limitations. So to highlight the importance of this emerging new way of knowing, if you will, um, I'd like to step back in time 20 years. So 20 years ago in web search and the web in, in fact in it itself was really nascent. Uh, the NCSA Mosaic graphical browser was less than two years old and modern web search engines were less than a year old. How many of you remember Mosaic? Ooh, <laughs> this is an old crowd. Uh, <laughs> um, Kai 1995 had an online presence. It's sort of minimalist, uh, New Times Roman. And there's a really interesting highlight here that says, to view the conference in a glance, you need a graphical browser. The web was really nascent uh, in 20 years ago. I, I usually do this interactively, but uh, it's a little hard in this audience where I can't see anything. Um, the size of the web, looking at the number of top-level domains, was about 2.7 thousand, okay, so 2,700 websites. Lycos and Webcrawler were two of the early search engines that actually indexed the full content of pages. The, when Lycos released in late 94, it indexed 54,000 pages. Okay. And in fact, it didn't index the full text of them because Fuzzy Malden was unsure about what the copyright issues were in building a full positionally, uh, a full content index with all the positional information from which you could reconstruct the full page. So times have really changed. Oh, um, there's another interesting thing about this. This site, uh, it, it's really wonderful to go back to Internet Archive and look at these sites as they existed decades ago. There's a link to look at the top 5% of the sites. So you could link and browse through 10,000 or 2,500 of your favorite web pages every day. What I'm, I think is most relevant to the talk today is that behavioral logs were also uh, next to, to non existent. So there were, um, Lycos received about 1,000 queries a day. You now go through an order of magnitude more than that in a modern web search engine every second. And the reason for this is that most search and most logging was done on a client. I started work at Microsoft in 1997, and one of the first things that, that happened was the office help team stopped by my office and said, fabulous, you're here. We have trouble with office help. We hear that it's um, less than ideal, shall I say, charitably. Um, and so my first question was, well, what is, what's wrong? What are people searching for? What aren't they finding? And they sort of shrugged and said, we don't really know. 
And it's not because they were bad, uh, they were bad um, engineers, they were bad human-computer interaction folks. They literally didn't know. All the documentation was on the, cl on the client. All searches were done on the client and never sent anywhere. Right, so when the move from Office 97 to Office 2000 was made, search went online. And that really transformed all sorts of things. That first of all, there was they saw for the first time all sorts of things that were people asking about that they had no documentation for. Things about, I used to do this in Windows 97, or Office 97, how do I do it in Office 2000? It also um, really helped mitigate some of the vocabulary mismatch problems that Elizabeth alluded to in that uh, tongue-twisting title. There's no place where vocabulary mismatch between what the searcher is looking for and what the authors have written about than online documentation. So they immediately saw people using different words than authors of the, um, the, the documents had made. So dramatically, with no change in algorithms, by incorporating, understanding and incorporating user behavior, search became better. Today, we're in a far different world. There are billions of websites, trillions of pages indexed by search engines, billions of searches and clicks every day. It's nothing short of startling. The, the magnitude is startling, and the fact that it works most of the time is nothing short of amazing. Search has really, I think, over the last decade been transformed from an arcane skill that, that library scientists or computer geeks possessed to something that absolutely everybody in the world does every day. Uh, there's a tremendous diversity of people using search and the tasks they look for. Increasingly, these we use it not just to find information, but to uh, buy things, to um, to look for medical information, to plan travel, to monitor current events. It really is a core fabric of our everyday lives. And it's also very pervasive. I'm going to talk today about web search, but search is much broader. It happens on the desktop and the enterprise and apps. The one place where I think it's lacking, I was complaining to Dan Russell about this the other day, is in the real world. I was walking through a, a store and I wanted to find granola bars. And my left fingers were twitching. I kept trying to type control F, you know, like get me to the granola bar. So I think there's still uh, a ways to, to go here. But in these, the times where search has been transformed from something that very, very few people did, a thousand people a, a day using the, the most popular search engine on the web, to something that, that billions of people do every day, makes it more and more important to understand and support searchers than, than uh, ever before. So what are behavioral logs? They are traces of human behavior through whatever lens or whatever sensors we have. In the physical world, we've all seen books that fall open to the page we've been to before. My statistics books, if I open them up, fall right open to uh, some complicated task, test that I can never get right. Sometimes they're more intentional. You might dog ear a page. You might write annotations and highlight, uh, put some marginalia in. You might do much richer write, uh, annotation. This has all sorts of equations written out as well as, as highlighting. It happens not just in documents, but in the physical world. This is a path. You can see the path that the engineers designed and the path that, that people take. And sometimes these trails can be much more ephemeral, such as uh, footprints in the sand. In the case of web search, the trails that we see are search queries the results, what people click on, how they reformulate those queries, how long they spend on pages. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking today is driven by these behavioral logs. What's important about behavioral logs, I think, is that they're actual behavior, people trying to accomplish tasks in their natural environment. They're not recalled behavior. They're not subjective impressions of what went on yesterday. They're not controlled laboratory tasks. And behavioral logs can be used in lots of ways. I'll detail these shortly. They can be used a lot behind the scenes to make it easier to find the relevant information, but they can also be reflected in interfaces of various kinds. This is a, a screenshot of a system called Editware and Readware that Jim Holland and colleagues developed in, uh, I guess it was in Chi 1992. On the left, you see a normal scroll bar with the region of focus highlighted. And to the right of that, you see a lot of scroll bars that are annotated by where people have either written or edited the document. Right, so the, 
the interaction with the document that happens anyway is reflected in an artifact that people can use to better navigate. Um, a more recent example is some lovely work by Adam Forney uh, and colleagues on something called Intertwine. And here the idea was to take browsers and feature-rich applications and try to provide um, a kind of inter-application scent. In this particular uh, screenshot, what he's done is for somebody who's searched a lot on a, on a tough technical documentation, in this case GIMP, he's highlighted what it what people did in the application with the search query that, that returned it. So here it's about transforming some picture in, into grayscale, and you can see that at, in their actual search results. So a really interesting way of trying to bridge across multiple applications with behavioral trails. Maybe the most uh, common example of, of uh, these behavioral logs is the auto-completion in search. Here I typed in CHI 2015, and you can see all sorts of other things that people typed after that. One of them that I was a little surprised to see was uh, rebuttals. That turns out to be something that people really care about in, in Kai. <laughs> and here's an example of my personal uh, search logs that in, in Bing that I can use for personal reflection um, or to refine. I guess it's not so personal now that I've shared it with some of my closest friends in, in the audience. But I did look for Kai as well as meeting planning and, and news yesterday. I want to... Uh, put large-scale behavioral logs in the context of a much broader set of research methods that, that we use. This is a gross oversimplification. If I don't mention your favorite method, uh, I realize that there are a multitude, multitude of them and that they're all interesting and important. What I want to do is, is focus on three kinds in, in this talk. The first is, is lab studies. These typically involve hundreds, I mean, tens or hundreds of people. Often the tasks are known. Sometimes uh, participants bring their own tasks. They, some of the beauty of lab studies is that they can involve very detailed instrumentation, video, eye gaze, uh, screen capture. People can speak aloud. You get a very, in some sense, a very thick trail of people's behavior, although for a limited set of tasks. Uh, you can evaluate systems that don't, that you can evaluate our experimental systems or even systems that don't exist if you use Wizard of Oz techniques. So they're wonderful in their richness and depth. They don't cover the breadth of experiences that I think that modern day web search services need to cover. There are also panel studies. These sort of are in between uh, large scale logs and, and um, lab studies. These often involve hundreds or thousands of people who download um, specific client side software that allows uh, people to monitor or to record behavior. Uh, it can al you can also probe about specific tasks or specific uh, conditions that are of, of interest. What's important about these in contrast to lab studies is that people are using th their uh, search systems and their computer in ways that they normally do. So you get a much richer sense of tasks and activities that people are performing in the wild. And the last level of analysis I want to talk about are log studies. These, as I mentioned before, in the case of web search services, involve millions of people and tasks. There's a tremendous diversity, a really eye-opening diversity of what people are doing um, with search engines and what kinds of things we need to, to support. Here, there's an abundance of data, but it's very thin, uh, and it's, no it's noisy, and it's not labeled. I'll talk about some of those um, challenges later. So in this range of experimental methods from lab studies to panels to large-scale logs, I want to highlight that one can do observational studies as well as experimental studies. So in the lab, you can just look at what people are doing, not compare two systems. Uh, in panels, we do it through ethnography or case studies um, or things like Nielsen studies. And in the logs, we often look at, at um, traces of behavior through Twitter and Wikipedia, for example, where we're not, there's no experiment, at least on the observer's part, in, involved. But we can also do experiments, at controlled experiments, at all of these scales. In the laboratory, it's obvious. In panel studies, there are clinical trials and field trials. And the lifeblood of many web search systems is the ability to do carefully controlled experiments 
and understand the effect that those have in realistic settings. So the observational data allows us to build sort of an abstract picture of behavior, the sort of things that we need to focus on in design. And then experiments are really to help us decide whether one approach is, is better than, than another. I think we tend to think about experiments as happening, carefully controlled experiments as happening in the lab and observations happening at web at scale. But I think this slide illustrates that regardless of the scale of the experiment, you can observe in rich detail and you can do careful experimentation. What I'm going to focus on today is this, the lower line here, I'm looking both at observational and experimental log studies. So the benefits of large-scale behavioral logs are, I want to highlight, there are many of them, I want to highlight three of them. One is that they're real world. They're a portrait of behavior in the wild. They're not imagined tasks, they're tasks that actually, actually happen. In a lab, there are lots of things that people will not do. You don't see a lot of porn, you don't see um, a lot of very personal queries, even if you let people generate their own tasks. You don't see repeat behavior. You don't see people issuing the same query over and over again. They'll switch to a new task. These are all things, um, personal, personal uh, searches, repeat searches are all things that are really evident in, in the world. And so we don't see those in laboratory studies. They're also large scale. Um, we can see millions of people and tasks and even rare behaviors can be examined. So if you get a billion searches a day, you can observe a one in a million occurrence a thousand times during the course of a day. Okay. And as I've mentioned before, one of the things that, that strikes you over the head when you look at how systems are being used in, in the wild is that there's just tremendous diversity in what people are seeking and how they're trying to satisfy those information needs. It's what uh, Chris Anderson has called the long tail of information needs. Search logs or behavioral logs are also uh, real time, maybe not as real time as Twitter, but the feedback about what people are doing, often reflecting events happening in the real world, is pretty immediate. This is a, the query distribution, the frequency of queries for the query flu over time. Uh, two or three years ago, there was a huge spike during the, uh, what flu was it, the swine flu, uh, but you can see yearly peer, uh, peaks around uh, winter time of year. This, you can also, see events. This is called the query gyrocopter that didn't happen very much at all over the last five or six years. But uh, f a few days ago when somebody, or last week I guess, when somebody flew a gyrocopter onto the U.S. Uh, lawn of the U.S. Capitol, it, people all of a sudden started asking about it. Okay, so I th these are, sorry, these are some of the benefits of behavioral logs that we can use to understand people and, and to improve systems. So I want to give you a one slide tutorial on behavioral logs and, and web search. So the question in web search is how you go from on average two or three queries to anything at all sensible. I mean, it is miraculous that it works. <laughs> right? The first stage of web search involved matching content. So matching queries that people issued to content of web pages. The next generation involved also exploiting link structure understanding who linked to your page, which pages you linked to, that allows uh, a retrieval engine to set non-uniform priors on web pages in, in retrieval. In the last decade or so, user behavior has been com become very important. The anchor text we use to point to web pages, the query and click trails that we leave, query reformulations, you try something, it doesn't work, you try again. All of those are important indicators of what people are doing and uh, what's succeeding or not, as the case may be. Contextual metadata is increasingly important. We know where queries are asked, what time it is, and those are really important in determining what's relevant. If I ask for, um, you know, I don't know, US Open 2015, at this time of year, I probably want to know about the golf tournament, which just happened. In a few months, I'll want to know about the tennis tournament. So all of this contextual metadata is really important in providing what's relevant to people at the right time. So all of these behavioral data um, are used to 
improve web search and, and algorithms in, in many ways. Let me just give you a, a couple of examples. So how many of you have ever benefited from spelling correction in web search, right? Like we can't type anymore. It's not that algorithms for spelling correction have gotten markedly different and better over the last decade. What has changed and what dominates that is the amount of information that we have. If people type a query, retype a variant of it soon thereafter, it's a pretty good signal that the first one, either that the search engine didn't return the right thing or that it was a, and perhaps because it was a typo. We don't think twice about crazy misspellings anymore in, in search. Uh, similarly, as I just mentioned, time and location are really important in helping interpret what people might mean by a very short query. The same query in different locations or at different points in time uh, uh, should probably be satisfied by um, different results. So going back in time 20 years, there were lots of surprises in looking at early web search logs. Web search was nascent. The intuitions that people had about what would work and what, what was web search was, was going to be used for, uh, what algorithms would work, were really intuitions derived from library search. And so looking at the early search logs provides really a reality check on what people want to do with this fabulous new tool, not what designers anticipated them doing. So there were several um, early web search log analyses, some through publicly available data that Doug Cutting uh, provided from Excite, and a lot of it from work that Craig Silverstein and Andre Broder and others did at um, Alta Vista. The, the, the thing that, that was uh, incredibly striking in the early web search logs is that web search is not library search. Queries are short. Lots of people search for sex. More so in 97 than in 99. And uh, I just looked yesterday at the top 200 searches on Bing, and uh, search, the prevalence of se search queries has decreased uh, markedly over the years, in part because there's other information on the web about all sorts of things. Navigation is a common behavior. So people assumed that searchers would look for information in much the same way that you do in, in libraries. But a lot of searches are really aimed at getting you to a location. So the most common uh, query in early search logs, uh, well, I'll see it in a minute, I, uh, was something like Yahoo right? you, or Hotmail. They were really ways of providing easy navigation to sites rather than seeking information. Um, queries are not independent. You find lots of queries are about a particular task uh, clustered at the same time. And as I've mentioned before, there's a, a huge tail of information needs and um, and strategies for, for solving them. This isn't unique to web search versus library search. Uh, when it's true for web search versus desktop search, things that you think you know from the web don't necessarily apply to the desktop. The same is true on uh, looking at web search versus mobile search. A lot of the assumptions that we go into systems with turn out when you look at, at uh, what behaviors are going on not to hold. So I want to talk about the, the diversity really to give you a, a sense of how important it is. Uh, the Excite logs w provided uh, 2.5 million queries. Is, is it really 9 o'clock? Yes, okay. We'll speed up. 2.5 million queries. Um, at the head, 250 of those queries accounted for 10% of the traffic. So you as a search provider, you absolutely have to nail those. The tail, on the other hand, there were almost a million of those that occurred exactly once. You also need to accommodate that. So it's a ZIF distribution. Here are the top 10 queries in uh, 1999. You can see them. Some of them are navigational. Some of them are things that were available on the web, po Pokemon, MP3, and so on. Here are queries that occurred only once. Some of them were Y2K issues. Some of them were these uh, completely crazy things like provide me the email of Paul Allen, who is a Seattle Seahawks uh, owner. You need to solve those needs. And there are a whole bunch that are more intermediate frequency. Uh, queries vary over time and tasks. There are periodicities, daily periodicities, uh, weekly periodicities, things that are trending, and events that happen uh, that are reflected in, in logs. There's also important individual and task 
differences that we see in logs. So a query like ACM awards, okay, we're, we've been talking about this earlier today. If I issue the query CHI 2015 right before it, you can be pretty sure what I mean. Um, if you issued the query country music, you may have meant the Academy of Country Music Awards, which happened last week and probably received much more uh, press coverage. If Garth Brooks asks the query, he probably means something different than I do. Here's an example, a really clean example of uh, queries. I just want to go through some of the kinds of things you can get by observing. You can look at a query typology. You can distinguish informational from navigational queries. You can look at queries whose frequency varies. Here, CHI 2015 is the most common query. That's pr not true in the, in the web as a whole. You can look at long-term trends. Here's a person who's queried on computational social science and social science several, several times. You can look at short-term tasks. Uh, these are actually several queries I performed just the other day looking at for the program and for registration times. So using these kinds of insights about types of queries, frequency of queries, repeat behavior of queries, we can design a, and improve uh, ranking algorithms and, and interfaces. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, most importantly, we can develop test sets that reflect real behavior rather than imagined behavior. Right. Um, so, I, uh, okay, uh, this is actually a very interesting example. So I'm going to rush through it, but I, because I want to mention it. So, search. For, this is going beyond using search logs as a lens for going beyond web. Web search, improving web search per se. Search for health information is incredibly common and, and important. About 80% of US adults search, have searched the web for medical information. Uh, one in 250 people query about the top 100 prescription medicines in the US. So mining health search data to identify uh, things like adverse drug effects or side effects is something that, that's possible. Today, these side effects and interactions are detected uh, based on reports from patients and clinicians. It's a slow, um, it's a slow process and, and not a very rich one. There was a, a study in, reported in 2011 uh, looking at the interactions of paroxetine, which is an antidepressant drug, and pravastatin, which is a cholesterol-reducing drug. Um, researchers discovered that these two drugs taken in combination seem to lead to hypertension. So Eric Horvitz and Ryan White decided to see whether they could find um, early warning signs of these effects in, in search logs. So they uh, looked at search logs from pre-2011 and found uh, quite robust signals that people who query on both of these drugs have a much higher likelihood of querying on side effects of hyperglycemia, things like uh, thirst or increased appetite or high blood sugar. Okay, so search logs can increase, I think, the speed and scale of detecting some of these. This isn't the end all of, of all of this. They're validating it in lots of other ways, but I think it highlights the potential to identify some of these things which can be further studied in, in other ways. Um, I'm going to skip this. I'll, so I'll get back to it shortly. So we can go from observations to experiments. Observations, as I said before, generate insights about behavior and ideas for uh, improving web search. But experiments are really the lifeblood of search engines. They are a way to sy systematically improved, improve search. They're used to improve all sorts of aspects of web search systems, uh, from ex system latency. People notice differences of as little as 50 milliseconds in the page load time. And it influences uh, search behavior in a multitude of ways. Search trails are used to influence ranking algorithms to compare snippets. Like, snippets are this very uh, important but underlooked, I think, oftentimes aspect of web search. They're the way that you figure out whether to, to follow links more fully. They're used to support and evaluate different spelling and query suggestion algorithms, and also richer presentations. How do we know whether putting these rich answer boxes on the right is, is useful at all, and for what cases is it useful? Experiments allow folks to become much more data-driven rather than hippo-driven. Ronnie Kahavi has this brilliant ac acronym called HIPPO, standing for the highest paid person's opinion. And so without data, that's how things often get arbitrated. Um, 
I'm not going to talk. I, I'm not going to talk about how to conduct experiments at, at web scale. It's uh, in, in some ways it's very similar to conducting experiments at smaller scale. Um, I do want to point out that some things are much easier to, scu to study experimentally than, than others. Algorithms, you know, the ranking algorithm used behind the scenes is pretty easy to study. It doesn't influence user behavior. Other things like new interface techniques are much harder because they require changes in how we interact with systems. And social systems are incredibly hard to study because there are huge spillover effects from a treatment that I might receive to a treatment that my friends might see. So the value of behavioral logs, I think, comes um, from providing often surprising insights about how people interact with existing systems. It allows us to focus energy on supporting actual versus presumed activities. Uh, it suggests experiments about important and, and unexpected behaviors. And it can support a wide variety of new search experiences. In addition, we can improve search in a whole host of ways using controlled laboratory systems. And really, this has transformed how search systems are designed, evaluated, and, and improved. However, logs are, have some limits. They can't, they're large, but unlabeled. Logs can't tell us what people were really trying to do, whether they were successful, what their experiences were, what they were attending to. The same behavior can mean many different things. If I don't click on a web page, is that good or bad? It sounds bad, but if, the, if there's a, an inline answer that shows me exactly the, the result I want, like the weather in Seoul today, it might be good. The experiments are, are limited, or logs are limited to existing systems. Essentially, logs tell us a lot, a lot about what and how people search, but not very much about why. And it's important to complement logs with a variety of other techniques uh, to provide a much richer and more complete picture of uh, what people are doing and, and how to um, advance that. I have several examples of this. Um, I will, Elizabeth, do we end in 10 minutes? Okay, I will go through. Uh, a couple of these and not all, the rest of them and wrap up and leave time for some questions. So um, an important thing is to try to capture something about the what, the why, rather than just the what. So uh, about a decade ago, we built a system called Curious Browser that captured, it was client code that you downloaded. Um, it captured a lot of implicit activities. So what queries you were issuing, what queries reformulations were, what clicks were, how long the dwell time was. And we also probed for explicit judgments about the relevance of a page and the success. Uh, okay, folks at the control, if you could uh, plug in or find another power source, that would be great. <laughs> um, so we probed for relevance of a page or succession, success of a session. Uh, oh, it's this that's not working. This, can you run the slides from the back? Okay. Next point. Okay, well, I'll, I'll describe what we did. Uh, what we did was, if you visited, uh, given a set of search results, if you visited a web page and, oh, Okay, let's see if it works again. Ah, great. You visited a web page. If you la later came back to the search engine or under a number of, of other conditions that we had in the state machine, we would probe whether that search result was good, so-so, or, or not so good. We also probed about uh, the session, whether during the course of a session you accomplished what you wanted. We then learned models to predict based on this plentiful but unlabeled data what the outcome of interest might be. And we found that using just a click, you can predict whether somebody is going to mark a page as relevant less than 50% of the time. <clears throat> so using just clicks, which search engines had been using, is, uh, is has a, leaves some room to be I improved. If you incorporate clicks, how long you spent on a page, so if you spend very short time on a page, it's much less likely to be relevant than if you spend a lot of time on it. If you look at other query reformulations and how the session ends, you can improve accuracy pretty dramatically. Um, we also could improve session success almost perfectly 
by knowing whether there was one page that somebody had viewed during the session that was relevant. So that's a, a great be, uh, it's a great result at some level, but what we didn't probe in that was the effort that it took, whether it met people's expectations. So people might have been satisfied, but it might have taken them a heck of a lot longer. So we were lacking something in, in these kinds of models. We've also done these kinds of things for abandonment, looking at whether when people look at a page that has a search result front and center in the page and they don't click, whether that's good or bad. And again, we, had, we did both a retrospective survey to understand why people hadn't clicked on things in the past, as well as one of these in situ surveys. And again, we're able to develop models to, to predict that. Um, we've talked previously in Jamie Tevan and, and others about the importance of refinding in web search. We think of search as a way to discover new information, but often people want to refine as well as find information. And this is something that was obvious from the web search logs. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm done. <laughs> uh, okay, so refinding was something that was discovered in large scale web search logs. We were able to develop new techniques that supported refining as well as, as finding. So what I've tried to, to do in the last two examples and in the, um, the shortened refining examples is show you how we move back and forth constantly between large scale observations, lab studies, and then uh, A-B testing in the wild to understand whether ideas that are derived from large scale logs are actually relevant. Um, let me just uh, wrap up by saying that what I've tried to do today is present a picture of a rich set of tools that we can use to understand searcher behavior from lab studies to panels to large scale logs. They offer complementary benefits and I think large scale logs are unique in the fact that they uh, cover real behavior allow us to see a tremendous diversity of tasks that are really hard to get in any other way and um, are real time. There are a number of challenges as I've highlighted, uh, but I think they offer tremendous potential and I thank you for your attention and, and time. I'd also like to thank colleagues from Bell Labs, Bellcore, and uh, especially folks who worked on an early version of a tutorial we gave at, at CHI on some of these same topics, Dan Russell, Jamie T. Van, uh, Robin Jeffries, and Diane Tang. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Sue, and thank you for wrangling the technology. <laughs> we'll try and go through a few questions here. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, many companies use these logs, like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, but many concerns are arising around the issue of privacy. Mm -hmm. Except for that, what do you think could be other threats for the user? Privacy is certainly an important one and, and one that I think is um, appropriately discussed in, in this forum. I'd much rather talk about some of the, um, the, the possible issues. I think you know, the control uh, and transparency about what's, what's being recorded is, is certainly important in that. Some of the uh, other threats I think are that design needs to be both bottom-up data-driven as well as top-down sort of design and inspired. And I think uh, it's easy to get into the, the mode where you are totally driven by small-scale individual results without taking a step back to think about broader design implications. I mean, conversely, you may have a brilliant design, but you need to understand how, how to, how to, um, to evaluate it, whether it really is, is working. I think the more you jump outside the box and design radically new systems, the harder it is to evaluate them with some of these existing techniques. It takes a lot of time to familiarize yourself with a, a particular domain and to understand, um, to, to understand what the um, behavioral signals are, are telling you. You mentioned lab experiments and yes. so forth. Um, with cameras becoming ubiquitous, mm -hmm. how do you think eye tracking and other facial 
expression detection mm -hmm. techniques may feed into future designs for the kinds of information seeking, finding, and retrieval okay. that you've been looking at? That's, that's actually a very uh, timely question because I've just spent the about a year and a half looking at one, what one can do in designing new search experiences with the assumption that things like eye tracking uh, will be broadly available um, moving forward. And uh, we're certainly looking at rich multimodal kinds of, of interactions. So I think eye tracking alone is something that's absolutely critical for some populations with uh, disabilities. But the eyes fundamentally are um, a sensor, not an effector. And so I think we need to, to view the eyes at, or gaze tracking as an indication of attention, but then complement it with other techniques. So one of the things we've been doing is looking on large displays at the focus of attention. And then as you pinch to, to zoom, zoom around the focus of where you're looking, not around the center of the display or some other area. So we're starting to look at some of those experiences. Wonderful. Okay, so um, is the term Google the number one search on Bing? <laughs> <laughs> I think I gave the whole talk without using that word. <laughs> um, I, I actually don't, I don't remember. It, 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 it is certainly in the uh, top 100, as is Bing. <laughs> Why can't we tell intent or goals from logs, or do you think in the future we will be able to? I think the, the same query can mean very different things, uh, mm -hmm. depending on who's issuing it, when it is, where they are. Uh, I think trying to um, – the only way to link behavior with intent is to have some label data mm -hmm. in there. Uh, I think the – and we, we try to do that. The Curious Browser model is one that tried to link relevance um, intents are so varied, I think it'll be really hard to, to build models for all of those. We, we try to do the, the best we, uh, we can. We are getting better by looking at a much richer set of signals than, than just the query. That's, you know, queries don't fall from the sky. They're issued by real live human beings at a particular point in time and space. And understanding that, um, that metadata, what previous queries in this session, previous queries in the longer term, I think, is a way to get at that. Um, but I think we missed a lot of the nuances that you find out when you talk to people in, uh, about what they were looking for. You know, somebody might look for CHI 2015 might be the query that somebody uses to get information about the time that this plenary has happened. It's going to be hard to detect that without, um, right. without some subsequent interaction on the part of the user. Right. And uh, I think this is going to be the last question because uh, you've already mentioned some of the work you're doing um, with you know, methods and also mm -hmm. with the cameras and so forth. But clearly some people in the audience here want to sign up and work with you. <laughs> okay. So if you would design a, a new search system and you had the resources in at least half of this room, what would you ask us to do? <laughs> um, First of all, we have internships uh, and jobs available, so uh, speak to me after. We can uh, work to, together. I think there are several shortcomings of, of uh, current search engines. I mean, one is that we don't do a very good job of supporting tasks. Queries are treated um, not quite in isolation, but we don't use what you do with the results of research is you know, cut and paste them and copy them to, to something else. We don't have a way of providing a, a richer way of organizing material, coming back, reinstating tasks when you come back to them. One of the, the, the examples I had showed that 60% of, 50 percent of time that people spend searching is in long sessions. So long sessions don't happen often, only 5 percent of the time, but people invest a tremendous amount of time there. Uh, and I think better supporting that. I'd like us to, to also think uh, more broadly about proactive searching, mm -hmm. things that are, are, will just surface when, when you need them. I think mobile searching is changing the way in which we uh, think about articulating our information needs. It, it, they tend to be much longer, more natural queries and um, more dialogue. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we are seeing some transformations. For me, better supporting tasks and making things uh, more pervasive in, in ways that are n 
more proactive rather than reactive, I think, are two really important directions. Lovely. OK, Thanks everybody, so please join me in thanking the inspirational and marvelous Sue Dumay. Thank, thank you, you, Sue. Thanks so much.